Welcome back everyone. My name is Adam Soroka, MD of Cavendish Group International um, and welcome to Future Energy Systems. We've had a brilliant morning. Um, we've only got a couple more sessions left until we close the event. So, um, which is a bit sad because I think they've been brilliant today. I've really, really enjoyed the ones that we've covered. Um, and I think Laura uh, Sands' uh, presentation just before the break is a good uh, precursor to the next panel, um, which is actually going to be focusing very much on data um, and the ecosystem of data, which is very, very important. So it's good to have a panel dedicated to this. And we've got some real experts on it as well. So the panel is called Establishing Stability and Functioning for the Future Energy Ecosystem, How Data and Digitalization Will Drive the Need for Change. And it's moderated by the irrepressible David Hartel, uh, Managing Director of Stellar Energy. So over to you, David. Uh, thanks very much, Adam. Uh, you know, uh, you, you're a, a good user of superlatives, but uh, I, I think I have to uh, adopt some of those for this panel today. We had a behind the scenes session just now for the past 20, 25 minutes um, that was fascinating. Uh, we have some really great uh, speakers for the panel. Um, really uh, great ideas and everything. And uh, it, somebody joked that we should have pre-recorded the uh, the backup behind the scenes and we could have just played that and not have to do this panel again. But um, no, it is a good, good topic. We've had some very articulate uh, presenters over the course of yesterday and today, uh, a lot of uh, great information. And it's not just about technology as we've seen it, it is, um, getting people to understand, you know, what is this data that we need, that we want to use, how how will we want to make a digitalization to, to help uh, drive the need for change, and how do we get people on both sides of this equation uh, properly communicating and applying these, these solutions successfully, and uh, maybe even without having to consciously think always about it. That was one of the points made in the behind the scenes. So, I want to hand over to uh, to our first presenter, who you had, as you mentioned, had just spoken. Uh, Laura, can you uh, say hello again and, and maybe give us a lead into the first topic of applying uh, data and intelligence? Thank you so much, David, and great to be with this super panel. So, I mean, I think that when we start to look at um, digitalization, I think thing we have to in some ways um, acknowledge is that we're quite far behind others and that there is quite a serious sort of um, catching up to be done but all sorts of lessons to be learned from other sectors and I think we need to spend a lot more time what I would call getting out. Um, when it comes to data intelligence, again, I think there is a, a big issue here about skills, but you're looking at certain key drivers in the sector as we go forward. We are moving from a very, very, very sector, all know each other's golf handicap, to 100, 100 million actions and assets. If you think that every single EV car can do two stroke three, different functions. We're talking about a totally explosive proliferation of action sets on this system. And any who thinks that we can manage this in an analog way um, is very, very much mistaken. So we do need to understand that the um, complexity of the system is going to increase exponentially, but that that is not going to be able to be managed uh, um, the current form. So digitalized data is not a nice to have, it is not an enhancer, it is actually an essential part of infrastructure going forward. Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Laura. Um, we, we've heard a lot about that, about uh, how the complexity is increasing, but somehow in spite of all that increasing complexity, which offers tremendous value on both sides of the equation, we've got to get people to do it the right way. So, uh, Laura, um, welcome. Could you introduce yourself and uh, and tell us uh, your, your view on this? Sorry, Karen. Yeah, hi. Thank, thanks, David. Hi, nice nice to be with you. And thanks for yeah, inviting me to join this panel and with, you know, some very, very well 
uh, experienced presenters on this. So, I mean, first of all, I'm very glad to say, Laura, I don't play golf. Um, so the fact that we're moving away from the golf handicap, you know, is, is a good thing for me and I, I completely agree. Um, and then in terms of that point about, you know, getting out there and, and learning lessons, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think, I think one of the things we've been asked to consider as part of this first sort of opening question is, you know, how can we use data to prevent critical power outages? And coming from Explio, I can give a couple of those sort of getting out their examples from other industries. So for instance, um, we work with um, EV manufacturers looking at, at batteries and using the data to predict when those batteries might fail. And so that type of data can then sort of feed into things like your warranties, into your parts ordering, into you know, your, your wider supply chain, into things like planning for your service schedule so you can do your workforce monitoring so it's you know it's taking those examples and looking in the in the really broader context about how data can sort of support the downstream processes and make sure that you are you're, you're maximizing the investment that you've made in these in these sort of technologies um, and also that you know you're you're pricing it at a point that is going to be sustainable longer term and then in maybe a more sort of a relevant sort of critical um example we work with the aerospace industry um, and where we sort of use big data to predict the optimum time for the the maintenance of engines so you know the last thing you want in the aerospace industry is for the engine to fail when it's actually on the plane so by using the data you know you can really make sure that you identify the optimum time to bring those engines in for servicing so that you don't have those problems going forwards so you know applying this to to the energy industry we are, we're in the middle of another critical weather event. Hopefully this one isn't gonna have quite the impact on our distribution network, things like Storm Arwen did, but what do we need to learn from things like critical weather events and what data do we need that can help prevent those critical power outages? What do we need to know about you know, the geography of our distribution network? What do we need to know about the, you know, the physical features of it? What do we need to know about the weather patterns? What do we need to know about the growth rate of trees so that we plan to you know, trim those trees back at the appropriate time? All of this is data. All of this data can be used to manage the network um, and, you know, and, event and, and help prevent some of these issues that then cause us all intense pain going forward. So yeah, absolutely data is there, but we need to build the use cases, we need to learn from other industries, um, but then we need to believe that we can do it and, and get on with it. Yeah, thanks, Karen. Yeah, a lot of modern airplanes, when they land, but by the time they land, the maintenance team already has a computerized report of, of any issues and anything they needed to know, and if they need to position spare parts. And uh, I, I laughed that Tesla has something where there's autom can be automatic ordering of spares or replacements. So um your your car decides it needs new tires and it bills you and orders them that could be a bit of a shock so uh but the energy energy industry we have so many uh, uh pieces of equipment or systems that could fail that could lead to these power outages how do we get that information to the right people at the right time and in the right hands that's a very good point um peter you introduce yourself and give your views I certainly will. Um, I'm uh, the co-CEO of uh, Greencom Networks, which um, in essence is an IoT platform that connects uh, all energetically relevant devices and makes them available for um, the development of applications that uh, we sell as a white label to utilities and they can then have new products and services for their end customers. So in essence, we kind of work in the trenches of, or the, the sort of the gravel pit of what, where all that data that we all talk about actually needs to be first generated. Most utilities, and you know, we're a German company, I can tell you from Germany, utilities are flying blind till to date, what's happening behind people's meters. And uh, we saw very early the need if the energy industry uh, once really act on the idea of transition, we need data. And that's what Greencom does. We connect all those um, energetically relevant devices, heat pumps, storage heaters, um, uh, uh, inverters, electric vehicles, charge boxes, and make them available bidirectionally to manage the devices and then have that data ready for everybody that needs to use it. That could be uh, distribution, 
um, uh, companies, uh, but most of the time it's actually retailers. And over the time, we've learned more and more the OEMs, the uh, manufacturers of those energetically relevant devices, start thinking about why selling those devices, why not getting into the service industry and becoming the provider of heat. If you want to provide heat, you have to be digitized, otherwise you can't bill it. Thanks, Peter. Um, our next topic was uh, data analytics and business strategy, developing an active network management system. Um, so we, we recognize there's data, we recognize there's things we can do, we have to have a strategy to do this. H how can this be uh, more deployed, Laura? Well, I mean, I think one of the challenges that we have is the skills within the sector. Um, it needs to be understood as a value. Um, it needs the skills in the system. And also, to be frank, I mean, if one's starting to look at all these dynamic interventions and actions on the system, um, we currently have a reasonably, although getting much better, sort of dumb system, which is really a bit like a hose pipe and energy just comes at you. Every part of this system is now going to have to be smart. Every part of this system is going to have to understand what other parts of the system is doing. And again, we have lived very, very for many years in silos. So we do need to look at this skills area. But I think there's something more fundamental if we are going to create a, a resilient, stable um, and effective dynamic uh, network system. And that is about culture. So in our report, in the digitalization report, you have a fabulous engineer who is looking at a 25 year, a, a year investment, tests everything to destruction. And hey, they come across somebody who's a digital native, who's looking at a digital solution. And the digital um, character is interested in smaller investments. They're only going to last 18 months. We fail fast. Um, we actually put things into the market to see whether they work rather than um, test them to destruction beforehand. And these two cultures have really, really quite a lot of challenges in communicating with each other and understanding each other's values and the value to the, to the company, but also the value to net zero. So I think we've got quite a lot of structural and management business strategy change that's required at the heart of our, our networks and at the heart of the energy system. Uh, thank you, Laura. Uh, Karen. Yeah, I mean, I I completely agree with that. I think I think this is the issue. It is a it's a totally different model for distribution networks from from what they've seen in the past. You know, this is really about managing these these hundred million plus you know um, users, but they're not just users, are they? They're providers of of energy back to the grid um, through this. You know, the new models that are coming in through the sort of DSO role, the FSO role, and I know that you know many if not most of the distribution networks have included their thoughts about how they're going to manage this new structure and this new way of working as part of their ed2 submissions and you know there are lots of different ways of doing it you know for instance i think ukpn has proposed a completely separate legal entity to manage its its sort of dso fso model going forwards but you're right you know in order to in order to get this active network management system in order for us to be able to use these call off contracts to be able to you know stand up and and switch off these these distributed assets we absolutely have to use technology and we have to use this active network management system approach um, but that is a complete culture change from where we've been in the past and it needs to be driven by the leadership by you know the people at the top and you say Laura you know it's, it is the digital natives it is the new the new sort of people that are coming into our industries who are coming in with that as their sort of their DNA and we need to listen to them and we need to not just listen to them but we need to learn from them and really adapt the ways of working and adapt the culture in order to make us you know, be in a position where we can apply the technology that's needed embed it in the in this in the organizations get it in the culture and actually deliver on 
on what it can achieve um, in order to meet you know the outcomes that we all need to need to be working towards for net zero Thanks, uh, Karen yeah it's uh, quite a challenge in some other countries that are hey, maybe farther David ahead I David if I, may, I, I just an idea comes to mind uh, you know combining what Laura and Karen were saying um, you know, I, I, I originally come from the car industry and I used to work for Daimler. And when, when Tesla came on the scene, uh, I was the CIO at the time. And when Tesla came on the scene, I, what we, we analyzed what they do. And what they do is they build hardware, not to spec in terms of the compute power of the devices, but they over spec the entire compute power of, of, of whatever, of, of every model in the car. And to, to Laura's point, when you want to combine those different mindsets, engineers, hardware engineers, build hardware to last forever, but to spec and to cost. Software engineers, you know, in Germany would say they build software, it can, and then, you know, it, it can change. So what we need to do in the energy industry, and that's what, what I hope the engineers, especially in the DSO sector, will learn and the manufacturers, overspec the compute power in those devices and the changes over time that we won't be able to foresee in the next 10 to 15 years they are software when we need to build hardware devices that have enough compute power in there that their adaptability and future readiness comes through software and this is where the mindset of the younger people that laura have defined will embed it in there and then we combine both We've, we've heard in some other panels yesterday and today about uh, the amount of data that we want to gather, but there can be constraints on how to get that data transmitted and everything. So the concept of edge processing is something we do in a lot of energy facilities. So not everything's gonna be in the cloud or at a central place that what can we do on the edge? So if we're gonna put smart meters into houses, uh, at your point there, Peter, is very well taken that perhaps there should be enough community Com computing power on that edge device to to make some of these decisions to filter some of the data to process it to kick out what needs to go back to a central place but maybe uh what decisions could be made uh, uh locally um we heard yesterday about you know refrigerators don't need to always be on so uh to, to remain cool so you know get getting your smart meter to turn off your refrigerator when it's when, it, when it's okay that no one's in the house, no one's using it, it's plenty fine. Or if there's some kind of weather condition going on outside that could uh, impact some of the settings inside, that's a, that's a powerful point. Thank you. Um, in general, though, uh, for this strategy, uh, Peter, the adapting this, the, 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 the systems to this, there's been a real problem in, uh, in Australia where, it, where there was an abundance of people adopting solar power on their houses and then the the, the networks was, was struggling with that because everybody you know either didn't want anything for the network or everybody wanted to sell everything back to the network so the network had a, had a challenge commercially keeping enough standby power uh, uh, economically uh, maintained to provide when solar intermittency kicked in so you know how this shakes out on both ends of the equation. How can we do a better job at this, do you think? Is that for Peter? Yeah, I think- Sorry, I, I, for some reason I was, I, I, I was disconnected. Can you guys hear me? For some reason I was yeah, kicked can, out. Yeah, you're back. I can hear you now. Yeah, just, just so the could idea you repeat your of- question, please? <laughs> Yeah, when, both ends of the network, both the user and the people providing the power going through a network, sometimes users have more power they're generating or they may not want anything from the network or they want to sell to the network and the network is struggling to commercially remain viable. How do they, how do they provide a standby power? How do they react? So we've got things going on that's a little bit disconnected. How can we do a better job at this, do you think, for, from terms I mean, of strategic I mean, decision? Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, ultimately, we, we need the bidirectional information and, and we need some fully automated uh, system uh, incentivized 
with incentives so that we have a fully automated reaction and incentive schemes that, that make digital devices uh, take the right decision. And that is pushing down what we do at the energy exchanges, you know, push the logic of energy exchanges down into the system so that devices can make decisions like they would do on an, on an exchange. So virtu fully virtualize and digitize exchange like decisions, incentive based decisions and enable systems to do that. I mean, we do that on, on, on most exchanges anyway, like computer trading is, is, is the name of the game for the last 15 years quite successfully. And we should be able to push that down into the home energy management and make any home a technical part of the energy exchange through logic and systems. Yeah, that's uh, it's going to be fascinating to see. I mean, we as humans, we 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 could see this. You know, will it will it be implemented fast enough? Well, hopefully, all the young people coming out of university are going to figure out how we can do this. But the idea that your home management system will decide, uh, no, Mister Network, I'm not going to provide energy to you, even though you want it, because you're not paying me enough. I'm going to save that energy and store it in my own batteries. And tomorrow, I'm not going to buy expensive energy from you because I made the conscious choice up front to store that energy, not exactly. not with you. So, you know, this is a, a complicated decision and, uh, uh, you know, humans won't want to or be ready to make all these decisions. I think uh, uh, in our pre behind the scenes pre-session, we were talking about that. How do we how do we make things be a little more automated where people ha aren't having to consciously always participate in this? Uh, let's go on to our next topic. Um, uh, the technology uh, integration and the customer understanding service models to enhance customer experiences. We've heard that in some other panels. Uh, Laura, how, how can we uh, enhance the customer experience? Um, we can enhance the customer experience by getting out of their hair, really, um, by actually not having to engage them to become electrical engineers or heating engineers. I mean, this has been a major problem with the energy sector for a long time. They have been trying to um, engage customers in something they're not that interested in. Um, I do believe EV cars will be a bit of a game changer on that. But fundamentally, I don't know where my data is coming from. I don't know how this computer is optimizing um, data between a national data center and a local data cache. I have no interest whatsoever. All I have is a very nice computer, thank you very much. And to be frank, the quicker we move the energy component of the services that we want into a business to business proposition rather than a consumer facing proposition, we will get the experts to actually manage the process much more effectively and I will get the mobility that I want, i.e. my 300 miles potentially embedded in my EV car. I will get um, the heat that I want because I want sort of 20 degrees um, and I will get the energy for my electricity. So I don't believe that we've got the right business models in place. I think we need to look to lots of other sectors. Um, it's pretty frightening how the energy sector looks at consumers. They divide consumers into six archetypes for 60 million people. Amazon divides us into 150,000 different archetypes. This is the power of data, and this is what data will bring, bring us, granularity, absolutely tailored propositions that meet my needs that might be very different from yours david yeah that's uh that's great well i didn't realize that was the the characterization between two industries but uh, mathematically and with our computer software and hardware it's not that hard it, we have to have that intent uh karen how, how do you think we can enhance these customer experiences yeah, so I, I think, you know, it comes back to talking, to listening, to use cases. Um, I'm going to give you a, a personal example as a, as a customer of experiences I've had recently. And, you know, I'm, I'm a relatively intelligent consumer. I understand the industry. I've worked in it for 30 years, but I've been trying to get new connections in at a property that we're, we're splitting, we're extending it, we're turning it from one house into two houses. So I've, you know, I needed 
new electricity connection. I need a new gas connection because I'm doing it in 2022, not 2025. So it is going to have gas. Um, we've looked at alternative options, but they're just not viable. I need electric vehicle charging points. And the number of organizations I have had to speak to and the number of organizations I have to coordinate. And then I speak to one and they tell me that they need to create me an MPAN and another one needs to create me an MPRN. And then I have to ring a supplier and saying, can you supply me? He said, yeah, yeah, but can you ring me back in a few days time? Because I can't yet see your MPAN. I can't yet see your MPRN on the national database. You know, that is not a service model for me as a consumer. I'm, I'm one consumer. I have one address. I have one requirement and yet it has been yeah a bit of a nightmare to manage the industry as we as we know it um in order to achieve that so you know if again picking up on on laura's points it's it's about who are the customers what are their needs what are their use cases how can we provide a service and you know i understand that with all this myriad of services you can't, you can't satisfy everybody but what are the processes that we need to get much better at so yeah i don't have to know what a network is what a supplier is what an ev charging point uh, organization is you know all of that i just i just want to be able to say this is my problem how do i solve it really easily and i think that is where as an industry we need to get better so that you know, we get more efficient and we enhance the reputation, which, you know, is not the best at the moment. Uh, that's that's good. Uh, unfortunately, there's a very nice chat bot wait, waiting to have a discussion with you. Well, about this. I've had enough of chat bots as well, but <laughs> they need to work better. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> Sorry, let me just. I, I, maybe, I'm being a bit unfair, oh. unfair there. It's throwing a little bit of red meat out onto the floor there. <laughs> Peter, part of the problem is finding <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I couldn't agree more what what you've said, and you know, I I have a sort of a pledge to an urge to to uh, to the utilities, and I'm I'm telling them when I meet the CEOs, and I say, guys, still to date, you have all your brand names have a good name of being the complexity manager of energy nobody needs to understand how to operate a, a power plant or you know manage the lines use your name as a trusted complexity manager and then reinvent your business and become the complexity manager of what karen was just describing karen had to be her own project manager dealing with five different engineering companies to just get something fixed in her own house. Utility companies could, if they if they put their mind to it, say, we will do it for you, Karen, and you have to pay us a service fee for you, but then we'll handle it for you. And they are not there yet. In the UK, I think you're a little bit further than we are in Germany there, but that could be the way out for the utility companies using their name and then becoming the complexity manager in, in home energy management. If they don't do that, it'll be the, the OEMs of the devices that we all are buying. And um, one other angle that may solve the complexity to Laura's point early on, uh, I hope that tomorrow the regulators will allow that hardware manufacturers can sell their devices, including the energy, and that we have a regulation that allows us end users to buy 25 different you know, devices in our home, plus an electric vehicle, and all come with their prepaid energy. And we have, if we have a system that allows that, then the, the, the manufacturers and the resellers of those systems have to manage their risk of is that energy that I'm selling as part of the fridge sufficient? And then they have to talk to other companies in the grid to, to fix and manage their risk, and they will take it away from us and customers. It's, it's sort of a futuristic view, but I hope it's coming. Yeah, good, this thanks. Uh, I think I have a local water company that actually is trying to offer to take over the, the, plum, the plumbing uh, risks and plumbing maintenance and and things like that they're offering that as an extra service so maybe that's one utility 
trying to participate a little bit more in the solution process. So our next topic, uh, overcoming insufficient interoperability, achieving a data-driven future. Uh, Laura, how, how do you see this? Um, David, I hope you don't mind. I just wanted to say one thing of, of, after Karen and Peter is that really when it look when we look at consumer facing products and services if you look at all sorts of other consumer facing products and services they are seamless they're marketed well they've got um, intuitive response mechanisms uh, peter says let's hope that this will happen it is happening in every other sector all we That's need it. to do is exactly people sectors who've been super successful dealing with complexity uh, managed expectations picking up the phone when you might have a problem these are weird wonderful activities and, and the, the recruitment issue and the mindset issue is absolutely crucial so sorry david coming back to your well, question about interoperability um, I mean, we've proposed we've proposed in the digitalization task force that we have a very, very, very thin layer of interoperability called the digital spine. This is absolutely our use case, and no disrespect, Karen, I hate use cases because they <laughs> only catch what you can think of today. And actually, picking up on Peter's point about everything being future fit, we need to think about tomorrow but our use case was prices to devices and what that meant an offshore wind farm able to communicate with an ev car now not that they will but the both the financial flow the system need flow of data and digitalization plus actually importantly the carbon flow needs to have the opportunity to be able to join both ends, as you rightly said, David, both parts, both ends of the system, and allow those in the middle, whether that be the energy system operator or the um, transmission or distribution lines, to manage that flow. And we call it the, it's like the HTML of energy. And that we believe will unlock a lot of value. One little example from the food sector, which I do a lot of work in, and that is the chief executive of Tesco or Sainsbury's, not that they would want to, but they can tell you where a half pint of semi-skimmed milk is in their supply chain. They can have visibility of exactly where it is on the M25 in a traffic jam because they have worked with their supply chain, with their logistics, with the whole of the system to create that interoperability. Now, that's what we need. Thank you. Well, I guess I need to talk to the waitress, the CEO, and ask them, where's my sour cream that keeps running out at, and my local grocery store <laughs> always run out. Um, <laughs> Karen. So, so I think, I think what we need to think about is, is how are we going to get there and how much of this is carrot and how much of it is stick you know what is the what is the role of regulation in all of this in terms of the stick and, and what are the opportunities that are going to come from consumers and you know particularly I guess you know if we can't see the opportunities at a time like now with you know with the cost of living crisis that we've got and energy prices going through the roof to you know to use data to data to drive out consumer benefit then then when are we ever going to get it but you know i, th I think that's that's the challenge for me i think there is i've, I've spoken to a lot of different organizations i mean in, in the role that i've got at xba you know i talk i talk to the retail energy code i talk to Offgem. i'm working on the market-wide half value settlement program which you know picks up all, all parts of the energy industry and energy sector and i work a lot on on smart metering and Everybody, I think, now says the same thing. You know, they're all understanding the need to use data to collaborate, to work together, but we need to really stop talking and make it happen. And if we aren't going to use the carrot and see us, you know, how we do it for our own benefit, then, you know, we need a level of regulation, but what is that? 
um, and, and when and where is it going to come from? You know, is is in terms of the, net, the networks, is there going to be something in the responses to ED2 which maybe puts some of that in place? I think we have to wait and see, but you know, we we need to implement what you know the energy data task force the digitalization strategy is talking about and we need to get on with it to be honest yeah i guess i worry about over regulation or regulation for the sake of regulation to justify stuff and everything and if, if our technology and our tools and our strategies are evolve quicker than the uh, the regulation can evolve then we can be constrained that that's what i worry about uh, i think peter you yeah. made that point in our back uh uh, behind the scenes things. Um, how how can we um, increase interoperability? Do you think? Yeah, j just a quick comment on 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 your um, on your regulatory thing. There's one fear I have. We all, you know, for the last thirty years, you know, really did um, liberalization in order to have more for the end customer. And, you know, with what happened in the market, we see that liberalization was a good thing. The problem is liberalization taken literally in the thousand utilities that we have in Germany, they have to build Chinese walls. So when we now talk about digitization, to a certain extent, those Chinese walls have to be, uh, have to be somehow be permeable or you know, we need to break them down to a certain extent and we won't because there's commercial reasons for liberalization. So digitization has to, has to overcome the principle that we liberalization and if it steps in to do that there is a certain risk that the over regulate i don't have the answer uh but that's something the regulator has to watch you can't have the cake and eat it so to speak so so th there needs to be uh, uh a solution to this the way we at, at greencom do this we just you know build technology that circumvent regulation and uh, we we connect devices, um, and the consumer has the opt-in and allows us to connect those devices, and then you know we provide those data to to uh, to the utilities and the OEMs, and then they can build products and services on it. So so we create the opt-in on the side, circumventing the regulation the regulatory side. And if you think about it, that's that's what Google and Amazon and everybody else has has also done. They use digitization to to a little bit circumvent regulation to make things move faster. We need to break things fast and learn from this. Yeah, I like I like that. Um, probably the regulators don't like that, but I like that. So our, our last our, our last topic. We've got about uh, thirteen minutes left. Our last topic: data accessibility and change management. <laughs> How to prioritize collaboration, simplicity, and agile leadership. So I think we're uh, getting into the the realm of uh, of leadership and, and choices. Of that um, so, uh, Laura, final topic. Well, I think we we we've all sort of touched on this subject about actual understanding and knowledge of what digitalization and data can provide a company. And it is this sort of engineer meets digital native sort of clash. Um, so there does need to be very serious movement in terms of um, recruitment and in terms of skills when it comes to leadership. But I think though, again, data and digital is not going to be a, an enabler. It must be a transformer. And as a result, the potential of utilities to really utilize data and digitalization to its full will by definition hopefully transform the business models that they're operating. Um, I think the other point which I think is very important here is about um, simplicity and <clears throat> every interface that I have in my life is made as simple as possible. Um, by tech companies, by companies who really understand the consumer, the consumer um, preferences, and then tailors it even more, refining it through um, AI, <clears throat> through algorithms, really refining their proposition to me. I mean, what Karen's experience shows how deeply far we are from understanding customers and being able to create that simplicity. And picking up on Peter and David's point about regulation is regulators need to understand 
that simplicity, that competition for competition's sake does not actually end up with great outcomes necessarily. We've got a lot of false competition in the system. There should be deep and ex excessive competition when it comes to wanting my business. But when we actually end up creating even more silos between the system, I don't think we're actually creating the simplicity or the service or no doubt the cost that consumers deserve. Okay, Karen. Yeah, so I was, I was listening to the, the sum up of the last panel and I think they, they touched on, on some of this as well. And, you know, technology change, you know, it is really difficult. It's very expensive. It can be very scary for, you know, those people who probably think they might be losing their jobs as a result of it. And so they resist it and they, you know, they, they push against it. But the, you know, how, how do you do it? How do you achieve it? And the leadership thing is absolutely key here. And your, your leadership needs to be consistent and it needs to be, you know, it needs to be proactive and positive. You need to lead from the front. You need to educate. You need to get that, that shared ownership. And, you know, as part of the technology change and part of, you know, bringing that collaboration, that simplicity and everything, you need to really understand what your business model and your operating model are going to look like from the start. And you need to take the business change process as you know, as such a critical part of your project from the start, so that you're taking the business users, users with you, and that they understand, you know, why why the organisation is doing this and what they're going to get out of it for themselves, for their, you know, themselves and their colleagues, the organisation and, and the consumers at the end of it. You know, we're we're also as well as being the, the digital savvy generation. You know, we're also the environmentally conscious uh, generation. And you know, as long as I think you take your your employee base on that journey with you and understand what the business outcomes that you're looking to achieve here and why this this really matters particularly as i say in a time where you know the environment is such a strong issue then i think you you stand a better chance of change being successful and you achieving the outcomes that you're that you're looking for Th th that topic uh, I, i'll i'll give you kind of a personal impression i'm here at event with, with lots of utility ceos and and at the dinner table um i had amazing discussions about digitization and i can tell you that today's leadership in the utility industry those people that i spoke yesterday they all get it it wasn't like that seven years ago when i first showed up at those events that was really educational so the top layer of the movers and shakers they get it but what I got from most of them when I asked, so why is it not happening? The almost normal answer, typical answer was, it's very difficult to get it across the company. It gets stuck at my middle management. That was sort of the common denominator of eight different discussions I had yesterday. How do I convince my organization that we need to, to, to change? Top management has fully understood what the name of the game is, but it just takes extreme amounts of effort and convincing to turn a whole company and their mindset around. Yeah, I've definitely, see, <clears throat> definitely seen that with the rollout of renewable energies, that you can uh, talk with the CEOs uh, or chairman of companies and they got it. And the, the young engineers, the young geoscientists, uh, they want to do it, but I'm I'm running into problems at the SVP EVP uh, level of exactly. guys that are maybe more fo more focused on retirement and less <laughs> less focused on uh, on uh, doing better. You know, people have a you know, tremendous value at stake here, and it's frustrating, and they don't want to grab it. So um, I think uh, leaders have to recognize this and understand where's where's the blocks. You you have to <clears throat> look down. In your organization, where are these blocks? Um, if you want it, it's not happening. I mean, somebody along the way is is not, is not on board, and so I guess that's a cultural issue that that everybody has to be invested with the the same spirit to do this. Um, uh, a little bit harsh, but I, I I saw the recent message from uh, from Elon Musk telling his workforce he wants everybody back in the office. If you're not in the office, he he'll, he will assume that. You, 
could you have resigned? Well, uh, that's a little bit hard, but uh, if we're going to tell people that we're trying to reinvent ourselves, we're trying to have more collaboration, we're trying to have agile leadership, we're trying to make better use of, of uh, data, uh, we want to get some changes. If that's not happening, that that's uh, is potentially you signaling that you no longer wish to participate in in, in the process and uh, harsh, but uh, uh, it's a tough competitive world out there and uh, people uh, may, may switch energy providers uh, to somebody that, that gets it more and offers them more value. So uh, uh, we'll see how that plays out. Um, we, we have uh, five more minutes. Um, any any other observation that we've missed here from uh, from the conference? Uh, uh, any of the three of you have anything you want to make a final comment on? I mean, we uh, we go ahead. No, no. Just, I mean, just to say, we need to to in some ways encourage disruptors to come into the sector, disruptors who understand other sectors, who've gone along this journey. And so I think that they will be able to galvanize companies to change. What, one other thing which I'm, I'm sure other panels have taken on board, but I think is incredibly important. And the more we digitalize our energy system, the more independent we become on our comms networks. And I don't think we should consider planning a deep digitalized energy system without working very, very closely with um, the comms regulators and also the comms networks. And one chief executive said to me, the, uh, in the energy sector said, the only big mistake I think I've ever made was that I sold our communications company. So comms and energy are becoming one infrastructure and need to be planned and potentially owned together. Yeah, I like that. Now the disruptor's that, point. Peter, go ahead. Laura, I, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. And I had one thought. Often what I'm hearing when there are pushbacks on digitization, the pushbacks come from that killer term cybersecurity, data security, but more and more cybersecurity. The thing is, digitization has also the solution again or preventing cybersecurity if you do it right. Technology is out there to do it. So we should not use cybersecurity as the argument against digitization and it's popping up here and and hey laura communication the comms industry has those so, so if we combine those that know-how we won't do a cybersecurity risk actively if we don't have that know-how in the utility industry, which is understandably so yeah, we're breaking up there a little bit, Peter. Karen. So, should I give one final thought? Yeah, one, one final thought for me, which is I, I actually feel really... The air networks are... Okay, I'll keep um, I, I actually feel really positive that, you know, we we have a really good opportunity at the moment to achieve change. And, you know, it's through some some fairly awful things that are going on in the world, but you know, in much the same way that COVID proved that you can create a vaccine and get it out and get it working in the space of 12 months. You know, we've, I don't think we've ever been in a more critical time for the energy to, energy industry to actually embrace the need to change and, and get on with it and get it done. So, you know, in spite of the awful things that are going on, we've got to take the positives out of it and see you know, how we can imp implement some of what we've been talking about today, um, you know, for the benefit of everybody. And I, I do feel recently, particularly, as I mentioned, all the conversations I'm having, I think there is an absolute willingness and a desire to, you know, to make change happen. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a good place to be. Yeah, I, I agree. I like uh, Laura's uh, point about disruptors, you know, the classic example of Apple providing products that people didn't know that they wanted or needed, but as soon as it was available, they they were so excited and and rocketed into it. So you know, when are energy companies going to uh, provide us what we don't know we needed and making it easy for us and dumb? We don't have to think about it. Uh, 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 is is fascinating. So I want to thank all of you today. Um, a great great panel. Um, 
and uh, appreciate that. And I want to hand back to Adam. Thank you, David. That was extremely interesting on the data side, um, purely because I, I really connected with quite a lot of those points that were mentioned by Laura and Peter, actually. It was quite interesting to see what what views are on data, because I think a lot of people are in the dark on how energy will be managed and, and how our data is going to be managed. And it's interesting to see similar views, but um, obviously there's a reluctance, but there's such an urgency now to change. I know um, you had the opening panel today with Eva talking about, you know, how we, you know, we've got to calm down and not change too quickly, but then obviously if you look at the scale of the population, energy demand, energy transition goals, and you combine them all together, and then you put into the equation technology adoption, you know, you're looking, there's no choice. I think you have to move very quickly. I think if those goals weren't in place and technology was not an enabler for those goals, then you could say, okay, we'll do it step by step. But I don't think there's any choice now, especially judging by that conversation. And it's good what Peter mentioned about cyber, because I think I mentioned earlier about cybersecurity, um, you know, more data being interruptible, more access to hackers. But at the same time, you know, technology should be used as a preventative measure for cyber, and it should be as well. So I think chicken and egg and, and, and you know, what comes with what, but we are going to become more data centric data is going to be more exposed and i think that's just the reality of where we're going to be um so it, it's a really interesting um subject area and i think one that's going to be talked about quite a lot in, in in many different forums and conferences so it was a brilliant discussion really well managed by dave and, and the fantastic panelists on that so thank you very much to all of you that contributed um we now have a, a sh let's say a, a last networking break half an hour go and see the exhibition stands if you can download some of the information we've got some really great companies on that vr floor as well um we've got the final panel coming up in about 30 minutes so it's two o'clock and it's a real humdinger of a panel um and it actually concludes the whole event in a really nice way so it talks about electrification digitalization and decarbonization obviously the three pillars of what we what all the utilities are looking at so and we've got some fantastic um, speakers on this. So um, I will see you back again at two o'clock.